Predator, and Fred. A violent crime occurs every 21 seconds in the United States. That makes us the most violent nation in the industrialized world. I'm Louis Gossett, Jr. Tonight, a behind-the-scenes look at stranger-to-stranger violent crime, aggravated assault, armed robbery, rape, and murder. What kind of people commit these crimes? Why do they do it? Each violent criminal was once a child who could have grown up to be a law-abiding member of society. But they didn't. Nothing went wrong. Horribly wrong. To find out what turns innocent children into brutal criminals, we studied hundreds of violent crimes and conducted in-depth investigations of six criminals whose violence and lack of regard for human life are chilling. These criminals told us that they agreed to participate in the film, that they wanted to deter others from a life of crime. So, prepare yourself. You're about to see shocking, personal portraits of violent criminals, the forces that shaped them and the destruction they caused. We hope that parents and future parents will benefit from seeing what went wrong in the lives of these criminals, and in doing so, help prevent today's kids from becoming tomorrow's convicts. Aggravated assault. An unlawful attack by one person upon another for the purpose of inflicting severe or aggravated bodily injury. An aggravated assault occurs every 38 seconds in the United States. It is the fastest growing violent crime in the nation. More than a million and a half victims last year. 71% of those arrested for violent crime had committed aggravated assault. The cost to society is staggering. The victims pay in blood, pain, and suffering. George Williams, Jr., age 26. Most recent crime, aggravated assault. Kimberly Minor, age 26, victim of the assault committed by George Williams, Jr. George's mother was only 16 years old when she gave birth to him. He barely knew his father, who died, and George was four. Williams has a professional boxer license. He showed promise as a fighter until drug use and crime ended his career in the ring. He is a habitual, violent criminal. I think Mr. Williams is your classical, generic inmate who is basically an antisocial personality disorder. Uh, this used to be called a psychopathic uh, personality. And he, uh, he is representative of much population in a custody setting such as this at Chino. I got burglaries, I got robberies, I got a sodomy, uh, I got two uh, uh, attempted rape, uh, assault. The only crime I haven't committed is murder. The hallmark of, a, of a, an antisocial personality is a person who will, uh, without uh, much seeming need, violate the rights of others. And if you add uh, aggression to that, he's willing to destroy uh, health, property, lives. If I approached a guy with a bat and I said, take off that watch and that gold chain, if he didn't, I would whop him. i say, now give it here. If he didn't, I'd whop him again until he gave it to me. Or until he was unconscious and not take it. He really doesn't know how to put himself in the place of another person who's being injured by behavior such as his. His eye can be busted, his ear can be busted, his mouth can be busted. I don't care. He, he's going to get hurt. So I break him down and continue beating him and choking him and stuff. Kimberly Minor was five months pregnant when attacked by George Williams. Hello. How are you today? That's good. What's your name? Yeah. Dion. You want to get a haircut? Does your mommy know you want to get a haircut? Okay. What kind of haircut do you want to get? I like people. I like um, 
giving the attention to people, making them sit there and making them love me. <laughs> and they have to accept it because they're in my chair. That's what pretty much I like about it. And I like the art of it. Kimberly and her mother eagerly anticipate the birth of Kimberly's first child. You know what? Boys are least expensive. You get a little boy, you can throw some jeans on him and sneakers and, you know, get his hair cut once a month or so. And then you got the girls, you got to go the whole bit with ribbons and barrettes and slips and lacy panties and stuff like that. The little girl would be cute, though. Look at that jeans. So what do you think about Mama Lil Set? No, I never thought I would be a victim of a violent criminal attack. Um... I always thought I could talk somebody out of not hurting me or be able to, you know, save them, <laughs> save them from doing wrong, you know. I never, you know, I never, it never dawned on me that I would be hurt. Kimberly was attacked by George Williams on April 27th, 1987, shortly after she left the Mexican takeout restaurant. I went inside and got a burrito and a soda and it came back out. I see her coming out of Ramona's. Put the food in her hand. So I run over there and I said, give me the keys to your car. And I said, give me my keys. I said, for what? And he said, just give me your keys. Do what I say. I said, oh, what's wrong with you? I said, shut up. You stupid, you stupid. I said, don't hurt me. I said, I got to go pick up my little sister from school. You don't really want to do this, do you? You know, and he's just constantly saying, give me your keys. You better do what I say and give me what I want. Because I'm serious. I'll hurt you if you don't give it to me. So I just start hollering for help. So I hit her with the brick. I hit her. I hit her right here with the brick. He had no mercy, you know. And I had told him, I said, you don't want to hurt me. I said, I'm having a baby. And he says, I don't care. So I punched her. I punched her in the side. Boom. The pain is still there. And the shock is still there. And, uh... The fear of my baby, you know, I have to wait till my baby gets here before, um, before I know exactly, you know, you better be going to be all right. Just wish it didn't have to happen to me. Only one photograph remains from Georgia's childhood. It raises an immediate question. Why did this smiling 11-year-old become a chronic, violent criminal? He didn't have a father or anything like that to, to uh, that he could, you know, confide in. So, you know, a woman can do certain things, you know, and then at a certain point, a uh, father should take up, and he didn't have it. My dad was gone. Can't nobody take that place. Can't nobody take the place of my father. I, I came up there, okay? I left home when I was about... 15, 15 years old. Okay, so I was the kid. I didn't know anything to do, you know, to raise my babies except for go out there and get in the fast lane. I did that, and I did it good. I've seen my mother use drugs. I've seen her shoot drugs in her bags. I've seen this. I've opened doors when I wasn't supposed to open doors, when I was supposed to knock. I was selling heroin and cocaine. I used to clear about two, three thousand dollars a day. You know. Oh well, I thought that's all it was. You know, I mean, make the money. You know, I, I know it was my responsibility to take care of my my, my children. He saw us going in and out of jail. Okay, now we move from place to place, motel to motel, uh, holiday inn. You name it, uh, any, any, you know, and uh, we didn't live there, and we would drag them along with us a lot of times, keep the heat off the house. I know how to cook the dope up, how to put the cotton in it, how to tie my arm up and shoot it up. Now, I knew how to do this when I was 13 years old. I was using it, you know, and it didn't cost me anything because I had it. Whenever he gets under the influence, he thinks about that and he wants revenge. Not just from his mother, but from anybody he can get it from. So that's why I feel like he robs and hits people in the head with bricks, snatch purses, whatever he's done in his life. I think it's, it mainly started at home. He uh, 
started to run with wrong crowds and, and things and, and when he was about 15, 14. And uh, at the time, he'd go off on the phone. I was in that atmosphere. I used to hang with people. That's all they used to do was crimes. All we used to do was doing something wrong. I'd go in the store. I'd have money in my pocket. And instead, I would still want to take it. You know, I'd have money, you know, three, four hours, you know, 50 cents a quarter. I'd have money to get what I want, but instead, I would want to take it. George leaving home as young as he did and things like that, we, we didn't have too much time to, you know, to really, we're close, but we didn't have the time that we really needed it. Something just snatched that away, I guess. You know? We got a lot of material things, you know, but one thing that was missing was love. Well, I gave George a lot of uh, oh, toys and money and you know, things. When maybe I should have just took him in my arms, you know, and, and you know, because uh, like my daughter, she's real affectionate, you know. And so sometimes a hug and what's that, a touch can mean more than maybe a dollar or two. Like she told me one time, she said, I wish I would have never gave you life. I should have cut your throat when you came out of me, you know. And that's something that stuck in me. That put a ring around my heart. It's right. I do. Maybe I, I, I stepped on mine, you know, too. I might thought maybe I, I hurt him. Sometimes when you, you start too, too fast, too soon, you know, you hurt yourself, and then you hurt people around you. I can deal with it. I'll have to really try to make condolences. After assaulting Kimberly, William stole her car, crashed it, and was apprehended near the scene of the crime. He is serving two years. We arranged for George to tell Kimberly how he felt about the crime. On videotape. Kimberly, I'm sorry for what I did. Please forgive me. I was wrong in every aspect for what I did to you and your upcoming child. I'm sorry. I mean, I was in the wrong frame of mind, but that is no excuse for doing something to a person such as yourself. Describe him as a pitiful person, a person who was lonely and desperate and just sad, a ball of hurt, a ball of anger and a ball of hurt. And I do forgive you, and I hope that God forgive you. I would like to think if the circumstances were different, you was not locked up, would he feel the same? If he had gotten away, that free. George Williams Jr. will be released within the next 16 months. This program contains graphic scenes of violence and language which some may find offensive. Viewer discretion is advised. Rape. Sexual intercourse with a female, forcibly and against her will. What image can convey the horror, the defilement, the violation that is left? Mannequins, perhaps. Mute, smashed, discarded. A rape is reported every six minutes in the United States. But only an estimated 48% of rapes are actually reported. Of those, 
about half lead to arrest, and only a fraction of those arrested are ever convicted. Eric Ennenberg, convicted rapist, currently serving 146 years, the longest sentence for a single offender, single victim rape in the history of California. When this happens, it happens immediately, just, just like that. It, uh, it's, I go from being me, from my normal me, from a normal person, to, uh, to an animal. Although it is alleged that Ennenberg has attacked other women, he has been convicted of rape only twice. Those attacks were vicious. He beat his victims, raped them, sodomized them, and tortured them. The mother of Annenberg's other victim helped the police track him down and gather evidence that led to his conviction. More than ten years after the event, the details of Annenberg's brutality are still open wounds in her mind. It was a very, very brutal attack. Uh, he ruptured both of her eardrums. Um, he uh, totally smashed her nose. A broken nose is one thing. Her nose was a smashed nose. Um, one of her cheekbones was broken. Um, she had uh, fractured ribs. Uh, she had a, a spleen that was very, very close to being ruptured. Uh, he then took a, a poker from a pot-bellied stove, such as the one decorators sometimes use, um, an iron cast iron pot belly stove and he heated the poker in a kerosene lamp until it was red hot and then he proceeded to brand her just like he brand a steer all the way down the side of her leg. Eric Annenberg should be locked up for the rest of his life. He should never be permitted uh, to move in society again. Uh, he cannot handle himself in society. Society cannot protect itself from him. Annenberg's latest victim is 21 years old. To protect her identity, we will call her Susan. She was so brutalized by Annenberg, she continues to live in fear. That's been my greatest fear since the day this happened, is that they're going to put me in a mental ward. And um, lock me up in some straitjacket, not being able to deal with it. Weakening, letting the shield that I built, letting it down, and letting it really hit home. That is my greatest fear. I forced her uh, to go into the uh, stone house and I forced her to uh, perform numerous sex acts. Anything that you can imagine that happened, happened. Your worst dream. July 10th, 11 p.m., a deserted road in Antelope Valley, California. Susan has finished work at a convenience store is on her way to meet her boyfriend, who is a caretaker at a Christian youth camp. Suddenly, she notices a car behind her. The driver is Eric Hennenberg. He pulls beside Susan, then he swerves and forces her off the road. He shoves her into his car at gunpoint. He tells her he is going to rape her. She feels the unspeakable horror of knowing she can be killed at any moment. Annenberg takes her to an abandoned stone cottage in the mountains. It is his dungeon. It's not sex, it's just rape. It's just violent. It's like taking an arm or something and not getting it back. It's like taking part of your insides, your inner feelings, and it takes it away. I'd have done anything if it could have been myself and not her. She was just starting her life. She didn't. Need, nobody needs anything like this, but especially a young person that's just starting out. I would have gladly. I wished I could have been the person, so she could have never had to have this happen in her life. 
It's just something being taken. It's your insides, it's your feelings, it's your pride, it's a little bit of everything that you've um, respect, your respect to yourself. Annenberg, who was married and is father to four children, seems incapable of really facing what he has done or the dark side of his own nature. No, I, I'm not a violent person. Um, I don't think I ever was a violent person. That this is not me. That's not the type of person I am. That's not. Uh, that's not my feelings. That's not how I how I work. I don't know why. Why he did? I don't know why he did. What? Didn't I do? What could I have done? What should I have done? I don't know. I don't know. Difficult question to answer, since Annenberg's childhood seemed to have been idyllic. He wasn't poor. He wasn't trapped in a ghetto. He wasn't neglected. His mother was there. His stepfather. Both there at Christmas. Both there all the time. At the time that I was growing up, it was pretty, pretty much uh, Chevrolet and apple pie. <laughs> but this child grew up to be a brutal rapist. What went wrong? Perhaps his childhood was not as idyllic as Annenberg remembers. Our research indicates they were a problem. A stepfather who favored his flesh and blood son over his adopted son, Eric. And a lack of discipline in the home. I spoke to many, many people, dozens of people, uh, that had known him intimately. But uh, in each and every case, um, the, the persons I spoke with alluded to the fact that the violence began very young in his life. He was a bully in school. He terrorized the other children. Uh, and going back to the time he was quite young, um, he had uh, committed various assaults on various persons. He had put several persons in the hospital. And at no point in time did anyone say, stop, we're going to stop you from doing this. Finally, a problem would seem to be biological in nature. Annenberg had a severe learning disability and could not adjust to school. He felt frustrated, angry, an outsider. Eric was called hyperactive. Um, he was on medication. When he was 12 years old, we saw a psychiatrist for, uh, with Eric. And it wasn't very many times, maybe a half a dozen times, and at that point, we were told that there, he was undergoing tests, and we were told that there was brain damage. And I asked the doctor what that meant, and he said, we don't know. And I said, what can we do about it? And he said, nothing. At his trial for Susan's rape, the defense presented evidence of brain damage to explain Annenberg's violence. That evidence came from the results of a brain scan which traced Annenberg's brain waves and compared them with those of a controlled sample of normal individuals. The defense claimed that in patterns of shifting colors like these, one could see the root cause of Annenberg's violence. To show you the one primary abnormal finding, the normal individual should have a color code that works out to a totally dark color. Uh, Eric color shows uh, bright oranges and blues when it should be all black. Uh, this shows decidedly abnormal brain function in the frontal lobes. We find that individuals with this type of brain disease in the frontal temporal lobe invariably engage in violent crime, and many of which are sexually involved also. In terms of whether Mr. Annenberg's color enhanced beam EEG is abnormal, and if so, what that abnormal, abnormality signifies. Any particular one picture in that test does not have any particular significance. As a general psychiatrist, I know that most people who have abnormal EEGs are indistinguishable from the rest of us. 
your EEG might be quite aberrant, but you could be functioning in a completely normal manner in every way. What triggered an explosion of frenzied violence in a brain which the defense claimed was damaged? Abuse, LSD, PCP, cocaine, marijuana, alcohol, amphetamines, and heroin. And he abused these drugs from the age of 13 to the mid-20s. And using these drugs during that developmental stage caused his brain to develop wrong and malfunction. I was consuming quite a bit of uh, alcohol and seed, probably at least a, uh, a quart uh, or more of alcohol a day and uh, $100 or more of, of uh, seed a day uh, for a good five, six days leading up to the trial. The pleas entered by the defense were not guilty, and not guilty by reason of insanity due to a drug-induced psychosis. But this claim fell on deaf ears because, as the prosecution pointed out, no one forced Annenberg to take drugs and never once did he seek help for his habit. My wife was able to tell me when, when I was about ready to, to, to go on one of these binges. And uh, she several times had uh, pleaded with me to go to AA, uh, go somewhere to get, get, get help. Uh, unfortunately, I wouldn't uh, listen to her. I didn't listen to her. The plea of legal insanity was rejected because, as the prosecution demonstrated, Annenberg's acts showed a criminal mind at work. He carried a gun, he used it, and he knew what he was doing throughout the commission of his crime. This man was in total control of this victim for the three hours that he kidnapped her and sexually abused her. He planned uh, the remote location where he was going to take her to. He made her conceal herself while he was driving her around where other people could see him. He held a gun on her to control her. And perhaps most importantly, uh, when the, he was determined to release this victim after the three-hour ordeal, he threatened her and her parents repeatedly with death if, he, if she were to report this to the authorities. That shows me thinking uh, of a criminal mind, a mind that is conscious and does not want to be caught. I reject his claims and so did the jury. Perhaps no better answer to the cause of Annenberg's violence can be found than that provided by Susan. He was enjoying the part of the scene in control. He tried choking me during the time that he was punching me, and he picked me up by my throat and told me that he was in control and that he could kill me if he wanted to. The key word is control. And they bring the pistol out, and it's the equalizer. And they shove it in a person's face, and, and they get a rush. They get that rush off of being in control. For the first time maybe in their lives, baby, they're in control. And you're going to do what they want you to do, by God, or they'll blow your brains out. And they get a rush from that. In our overcrowded prisons today, there are many men, chronic, violent criminals, who get a rush of a control. They like to bend others to their will. They find violence the ultimate high. They like to hurt. They are, in fact, so lacking in moral faculties and afflicted by such a sickness of soul that they are incapable of feeling any sense of personal responsibility for their crimes. Is Ellenberg such an end? I certainly hurt the women. But it, it wasn't something that, uh, that uh, I thought about. It wasn't something that I was conscious of. It just happens, and, and it, just, it just boom. Once uh, this happens, uh, uh, it's not me anymore. I am not in control anymore. And it's this, uh, this, this other person that I'm watching. Denial of responsibility leads to a choking off of emotion. Annenberg has so distanced himself from his crime, he seems incapable of feeling grief, remorse, or compassion for Susan. 
whose interview we showed him on videotape. That's, my, that's been my greatest fear since the day this happened, is that they're going to put me in a mental ward. And um, lock me up in some straight jacket. Not being able to deal with it. Weakening, letting the shield that I've built, letting it down, and letting it really hit home. That is my greatest fear. Well, I don't like to watch it. I don't like to... Uh... I don't even really like to hear it, to tell you the truth. I, what, you know, there's not a whole lot of good that uh, my tears or, or my sorrow can do for right now. Uh, it's something that I guess she'll have to deal with herself, and hopefully she'll be able to. Uh, they... It's yours. I don't know. Maybe they would. I. I want to. Uh, I'm not going to try on uh, national TV. That's it. Maybe that makes me a hard, callous person, but. Uh, because of his unwillingness to accept responsibility and his lack of empathy, some psychiatrists would label Annenberg a sociopath. Susan, who has suffered so much, renders a harsher judgment. He's the type that should have been, probably been killed when he was a baby. And that would have been a lot better to society. Because he's hurt a lot of people. Eric Annenberg will be eligible for parole in 73 years. This program contains graphic scenes of violence and language which some may find offensive. Viewer discretion is advised. Armed robbery. The taking of anything of value from a person by weapon or violence. Someone is robbed every 58 seconds in the United States. Robbery accounts for 36% of all violent crime. Nearly two-thirds of all those arrested for robbery are under 25 years of age. Many of these Jews belong to street gangs, which represent a distinct subculture of violence. For their white, black, Asian, and Latino members, the gangs represent a way of life. Family. David Lopez, 25 years old, serving seven years for armed robbery. John Dugan, 23, Lopez's victim. John manages a pizza parlor, is married, and has a young daughter. I was always raised right. My background, my parents, and all of them are raised right. Just kind of like passed on to the family. David Lopez is incarcerated in the California Correctional Institution. Wherever I went, I mean, if something happened, I was the one of the first ones ready to fight. As far as all my crimes going, it was the same thing, you know what I mean? I was the one who first initiated them. I wouldn't say the mastermind, but I was game for just about anything. John Dugan and David Lopez met in November 1985. I was about 10 p.m. in a fairly low-volume store, and I was on the phone talking to my wife here, and we basically talked every night, and I was just letting her know how things are going and how her day was. No. All right, well, yeah, it was kind of slow tonight, but, you know, I should be able to get out of here pretty early. Tonight. I'm not really sure if we have much paperwork or anything to do like that, but, you know, what'd you have for dinner? Money! Okay. Now! Okay, I'm getting it. I'm getting it. I'm going. Stop talking, man. Be cool. Come on. Come on. Oh, my God. Give me the money! Don't hurt me. What are you doing? I'm getting my keys. I'm getting my keys. Easy. Easy. I'm getting my keys. I'm getting them. Okay. It's open. It's open, man. Man, go ahead and go. Leave me alone, man. That's all I got. That's, That's all, all, all of it, okay. man. Okay. Come on. I want to go around. Where is it? Get it, man. Okay. Okay. Get it. Come on. Where is it? Right here in the chest. Get it. Okay. I'm getting it. Come on. Hurry up. Be cool. Don't hurt me, man. Don't hurt me. That's all I got. Come on, man. Come on. Get on me, man. Shut up, man. Get on the floor. Okay. Now, 
Oh, your throat. No. You stay here, just like this. I won't go. Hey, man, you got it? Yeah, I got it. I won't move. You feel this? Yes, I do. Oh. Now you feel this? Yes, I got it. You I won't move. move, man. I won't. And you're dead. No, I won't. You got that? Yes, I got it. Stay I got it. out. Get out of here, man. Come on. I was petrified. I, you know, I didn't know what he was going to do to me. He had the knife against me all the time, pushing me, shoving me, you know, and he was talking like he would use it. If he would have resisted, um, I would have got sucked up. Or that probably would have got stabbed. Pamela here, I just married her about five months before. And when he was having to go to the back room, I was wondering if I was ever going to see her again. You know, that's flashed through my head many times. You know, if he did anything that I did not want to be done, my little daughter Amanda wouldn't be here right now. We have thought about this crime. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it just happened, you know what I mean? It's part of the monster, isn't it? Dave and David Lopez has a long criminal record, including prior convictions for attempted robbery, kidnapping, and attempted murder. What made David Lopez go wrong? painful to think back of the years that I wasn't a good mother. That I think back of all the times they, that my children needed me and I wasn't there. I was there physically, but not mentally. I was not able to listen to them when they needed me. I don't know, and I'm not too close to my mom, you know what I mean? I am and I'm not. I mean, I love her, but... um. When I was small, my mom wasn't there, you know what I mean? Well, I got married when I was uh, 16. I had um, seven children, my first husband. Then I remarried when David was about three years old. My stepfather's been around since I was two. He's the only father I've known. As far as a role model, <laughs> he wasn't a very good one. He's a drug addict, ex-drug addict criminal and spend the jail. When David was growing up, I didn't have time to to listen to any of his problems. I was involved in just getting by. As I got older, you know, she was um, she wasn't into getting in trouble but she was alcoholic. I fell into drinking and taking pills and um all kinds of things going with that kind of lifestyle. There's times in there they're, they're bringing them up that I don't even remember. She always had food on the table to sleep. As far as being there as a mom for support, never happened. I think David got into trouble for a lot of reasons. I think because he didn't have parents uh, to set standards, to set to discipline him, to um, set examples. After a certain age, it was just like, I ran my own program, did what I wanted regardless. For David, being on the street and unemployed like so many underclass youth, running his own program meant joining a street gang. Like a family, like brothers and sisters. There's a love between you, know, I mean, camaraderie, whatever you want to call it. That love sticker of family. I mean, I'd do anything for most of my homeboys. They'd probably do the same for me. Doing anything for fellow gang members means a readiness to submit to violence, to defend one's turf against rival gangs, to shoot, to kill. Gang-related violence is rising at an appalling rate. I find crime exciting because uh, it's like living on the edge, you know what I mean? And then it's like a high. You get all that adrenaline pumping. It's like a high. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's more addicting than the money.
Prison has not changed Lopez's attitudes or values. He still lives by the code of the gang. Your side, you would see one thing. I'd say, man, that dude's just a dog. I mean, but to me, yeah, I'm proud of myself. Regardless of what I've done in the past, I'm proud of myself. Gang membership is a double-edged sword, as David and his mother learned all too well. The last time I cried was when my um, I had a brother and sister die. They died on the same night. Gang lives with you. My son had had some trouble with uh, another neighborhood. And um, I don't know if they had heard that they were going to be at that party or how it happened. But they came in and they shot my son in the chest with a shotgun. And my daughter just got in the way of the fire, and they found her later on under a truck. They'd been shot through the head with a 38 revolver. There was, uh, as far as my part of my city, a lot of anger out there. When my daughter and my son got killed, I was drinking a case of beer a day. I was taking pills to wake up and to go to sleep with. But while this tragedy further embittered and hardened David, it had a profoundly different impact on his mother. I thank God for my kitty and all my pretty toys. Despair was replaced by faith. Mary experienced a spiritual awakening. Today she teaches preschoolers in a church setting. Although it's dark outside now, God is with me yet. The Lord came into my life, and he did put in his son in my life in my heart, and he's given me a whole new beginning. <laughs> love your children, love them as every day might be the last day, because you don't know how long you're going to have them. I think the pain is from having taken my children for granted. That I was always going to have them. And a lot of the pain is because my sons are not living the way they should be living. During her frequent visits to David in prison, Mary never failed to express her love and concern. Mm -hmm. How are you? Oh. How you doing? Right. Yeah? David, you know I want the best in your life. I pray that you come to God and that you live your life for God. Because that's the only way it's going to work, you know. I feel compassion about David's victim. I feel if there was anything I could do to make it up to him, I would. I will definitely pray for him. That's all you got. John Dugan has been scarred. But like most victims, he has unresolved feelings toward his attacker. Feelings he would like to express. If we were meeting, you know, neutral and this, that, I would be angry, you know. Um, he's got to prove himself to me. I mean, he did, he scarred me for life. I would love to give up. I would love to bring my emotions. We made it possible for David Lopez and John Dugan to meet in person. Such a confrontation is extremely rare. I don't know what to say. What do you want to say? Nothing. You give it to 
it what you did to me? You don't really give a shit, do you? I said I don't give it, man. It's just what I did wasn't to you, man. I wasn't robbing you, I was robbing the store, man. Just the tough guy, huh? You can't picture at all what the hell you did to me. I know what I did to you, man. And it doesn't bother you at all. Not the way you figure it should bother me. <clears throat> so you're trying to tell me you well, robbed the store? I think I say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry's a sorry word, man. That ain't gonna change nothing that happened in the past, is it? I don't want to hear you say you're sorry. I ain't gonna say it. You scarred me probably for life. And you're saying, oh well, too bad, huh? Another guy bites the dust. Oh, well, you're biting the dust now. You're a joke, man. I'm a joke? You're a joke, man. This is for you. Come on, spit it all out, man. This is for you. Oh, this is for me. I'm trying to be cool here. I want you to get up and wring your neck. I really do. But what's that going to prove? It ain't worth it, man. It ain't worth it. You're not worth it. Are you finished or what? Man. Go oh, ahead, yeah, man. Let's start. Feel better. Set it. I'm done. Forget it. David Lopez will be released from prison later this year. Murder. The willful killing of one human being by another. A murder takes place every 25 minutes in the United States. Almost half of those arrested for murder are under 25 years of age. As for the victims, 8 out of 10 murdered men are killed by men, and 9 out of 10 slain women are killed by men. While some of these killings occur as part of a burglary or robbery, a greater percentage occurs after argument or on impulse, a spontaneous deadly attack, like the case you're about to see. Ernie Rue, 28, convicted of first-degree murder. Carl Bill Jr., 20, Rue's half-brother, convicted of second-degree murder. David Abbott, the victim. He was 29 years old when he was killed in 1983. David and my daughter had a real special relationship. And I've been divorced for years. And basically, David was her father figure. She looked up to him. She respected him. He had a wonderful sense of humor. But he was deep. He loved sincerely. And he was honest with his love. I guess that's, I miss that the most. It's terrible to say you don't appreciate someone until they're not around. And you don't realize what an impact they have. And <laughs> at least, you know, I can sit here and, and think, David, you did. <laughs> you meant a lot. And you, some of the things that, you know, he said and did, well, hey, look at my daughter. She'll never forget them. I mean, they were so important to her, important enough that she feels that her uncle was a great person. Due to the nature of this crime, Carl Dill Jr. was tried as an adult, even though he was only 16 years old. The brothers entered pleas of guilty and are now cellmates in maximum security. Their version of the murder is the only one we have. Well, it started off to be with a, with a night out of town, you know, with my brother and, uh, and this girl. We're at the bar, we're drinking, I'm ordering drinks, you know. If I still drink them, I'll buy them another one. I had the money. It didn't matter to me then. And then we meet this guy, Abbott. And uh, 
he seemed like a nice guy. He was drunk. But uh, we were playing pool with that guy for drinks. But then we found out he couldn't afford his drinks, so I bought him drinks anyway. Um, after a while there, I uh, gave the guy some money to give us a ride home. Money for gas. I was in the back seat, you know, pulling around. Wasn't paying much attention to where we were at, what was going on. So we drive up to a gas station. He gets out, gets the gas, gets back in the car and starts driving. I get the car to pull over. You got my cash from the gas station. Get out of here. Did you, go? Oh, hey. you know, there was a roar, you know, a yelling. I took it like as he needed, needed my help for some reason, you know, because this guy had to, you know, was yelling. I just reached up there and wrapped my arm around the guy's throat and held on as tight as I could. He was pulling so hard and I could just feel his neck popping. His head was coming back, but the rest of his body wasn't. And then, um, uh, I stabbed the guy. I thought all the way up until the time I turned myself in, I only stabbed him twice. It went so quick. I remember the blood just hit, spraying out, hitting the windshield and coming back on me and rolling down the back of the seat. They said I stabbed him about 20 something times, somewhere around there. Um, it's hard to say if I could have, uh, done it in a different way. It all went too fast. I was scared. I was drunk. Um, my brother's in the car. Nobody's going to hurt my brother as long as I'm there. Throughout all our life, out of all the family, he's the only one I've ever looked after. So there's no way that's going to happen. So I did what I thought at the time was necessary. Why did they feel it was necessary to kill him? I mean, from what the police told me my brother's blood alcohol content was high. Um, there was no need to. There was no need to kill him. The truth about what actually happened during the final moments of David's life may never be known. The next day, his body was discovered in the blood spattered car with multiple knife wounds in his throat, chest, and abdomen. For five months, the murder remained a mystery. Then, Ernie Rue was arrested on a completely unrelated charge of drunk driving. And, at that time, consumed with guilt, he voluntarily confessed to the slaying of David Abbott. What events in the lives of these half-brothers led them to commit a spontaneous, violent murder? Parents are partially to blame. Not for their children doing what they do. Maybe for creating an environment that would allow them to do something they wouldn't like them to do. When Ernie was six years old, his parents divorced, and Ernie's happy life changed dramatically. Part of Ernie's background was to run, to avoid responsibilities. He was taught that between 7 and 14. He was taught that by his mother. There was no roots. There was no best friend when he grew up. He could have a best friend, but it could only be for eight months because you were going to move to a new school. I was alone raising them quite a bit by myself, and they more or less had to do for themselves. You know, I'd wake them up, and they would have to get breakfast and take care of each other. With her, she was with a lot of guys, uh, a lot of them. And when I tried to explain how I felt about it, oh, you don't know that, and you're just a little kid. That's what she would say. Um, there was no foundation there. Her values were set wrong, well, so that's what I learned. Ernie wanted to live with his father, but the court granted custody to his mother. Ernie expressed his feelings to live with his father, and I told him that if he needed his dad, there was a phone on the wall. He could call his dad at any time. When I go see Ernie that time, Ernie did not want me to go. 
I doubt if that's any different than any other child. Except anyone to come with me. There's a point where you make the decision and you see what you're doing to the to the child by seeing him. The decision was, Ernie, you've got to handle it. And I can't see you that often. Even though he said he wanted to be with us more, I don't think he he did, but he didn't. You know, because he had things that he he was he was always involved in things. Um, he used to collect little toy trains and stuff and uh, go around these places that uh, had the tracks all set up. And he'd go camping and you know a lot of stuff he can't do with a little kid. But then again, he still wanted to be the father. Mabel's second marriage was to Carl Dill. The family environment they created was even more unstable and disruptive. When they were young, I tried to be the best father I possibly could. I, I didn't... I, I really thought that I was a good father. Um, today I can see that I wasn't because I was... Oh, I was crazy man most of the time. I'd go for three or four months without drinking, but whenever I drank, I would not. It was like a battlefield, you know, when mom and dad were all together, you know, and uh, they got into a fight. I don't know what it was over. And I was only about five years old, and, uh, you know, they were knocking at each other, you know. Mom picked up the telephone, hit dad in the head, you know. Little statues flying across the house, little nicknames. And uh, all I could do was hide under the bed, you know. And my brother took off and went and got the cops, you know. And that was the, the only time that I could really remember of uh, any battles between them. I hated her for that sometimes. Because you know, I love my dad, you know. I love her too, but... So all I had to do was look at them, and they'd freeze in their tracks. Like there was... I thought it was respect at the time. More fear than anything else. Because I did have a way of coming down on people strongly. I told them I was going to spank them. I beat them. I didn't spank them. I think had I not been drinking when I was raising my kids, I probably would have done a little bit different job of raising them. Maybe instilled those values that that I really felt, feel are sacred today that I didn't then. I you know, uh, would have tried to be more of a close, close father than I was. When Carl Jr. was 11, Mabel divorced his father. Working two jobs to make ends meet it became even more difficult for her to control her boy's behavior. I used to sneak in the middle of the night out to the refrigerator, grab a few beers, you know, take them back to my room. The drinking was a family on the holidays. Everybody did it. You know, the kids were allowed one drink with the family. Um, as for him drinking elsewhere, I knew nothing about it. Then when I got into, you know, like junior high school and things like that, it started, you know, the marijuana, smoking it quite a bit, you know, every, every other day or so. And then there was, you know, like black beauties and things like that that the kids at school had, you know, I'd take them. You know, it hurts to see kids on drugs and doing things like that. And so, you know, I'd take these drugs, you know, so I wouldn't have any feeling about what I was doing. You know, I didn't care. You know. I never really saw the violent side of Carl. And uh, that's why it all came to a shock. As the brothers grew older, they took the drinking and violence they experienced at home to the streets. Carl was a bully in school and was once arrested for armed robbery. Ernie was arrested for assault, pimping, and drunk driving. By their teenage years, both boys had serious drinking problems. Well, I think the biggest reason for the boys riding up in prison was the drugs and the alcohol. Um, Ernie was in a group that did all this, and uh, he introduced his younger brother to it. My relationship with my mother is much. She, um, she's been here twice. Since I've been here, I've been here almost three years. Um, she writes once in a while. Um, 
we just haven't been that close, especially since this happened, because uh, this crime happened. Because she blamed me for my little brother being involved. I wasn't pushed into doing what I did, all I had to do was say no, and that would have been it. I could have got out of the car and left, you know, but I wanted to be there with my brother. And when it happened, you know, I just reacted. By being in this film, the brothers knew their family would learn the truth. Carl wasn't just a passenger in the car that night. He actively participated in the murder of David Abbott. That's kind of hard to take. Because Junior's not the type. She didn't say he blacked out. Uh, unless he was being pushed into it on drugs. And I really don't. If he says he did it, I have to go with him and believe that he did this. But it's really hard to take because he's not that type of kid. I might have been, you know, uh, tried to stop him from going out because I knew that Arnie had been drinking that day. But I didn't know that my little baby had been drinking. You know, and uh, I didn't want to accept that my, my youngest son was that much like my like I was when I was his age. Do I feel personally responsible for Ernie murdering somebody? No, I do not. Do I feel embarrassed, hurt, sad? Do I feel crushed? I certainly do. Did I turn myself inside out when I when he wrote me a letter and for the first time in his life had to face me as a man? And in that letter he did and say, I took someone's life. It was hard it was hard for him to say that, so it was for me to read it. The worst part of it, I mean, for me, has been really the, the, the uh, agony of seeing those boys go through what they've had to go through. I know that, you know, there's nothing on earth could replace that guy, but I wish we could. You know, I wish we could just snap it back four, four years ago, five years ago, and say, okay, let's start from here. The most horrible thing about my crime, to me, is, is the fact that I've learned that I could actually kill a man. I never thought I could do that before. And uh, I don't like it. Uh, I'm scared, you know, about doing all this time. I'm, you know, I'm only 20 years old. I may have to be in here until I'm 30 or 40. I don't know. And uh, that really scares me because when I get out, what's there going to be to do for an old man, you know? And uh, probably around that time, I'm not going to have too much of a family left. And that's what scares me. I was alone so many years with my three children, and now there's nothing. Um, you can leave and work, there's nothing, it's an empty house, and it's going to be for a long time. I don't know how long, but it's going to be a long time. One day, Mabel's sons will be paroled, but Debbie will never see her brother again. What a waste. They don't realize it wasn't just David that they hurt. You know, it wasn't. I, I look at all the people and all the things that have come about because of this. I mean, they killed my brother, but it changed my whole family's life. And I, I feel like I just, I've lost a big part of my life in David's eyes. Carl Dill Jr. will be eligible for parole in the year 2000. Ernie Rue will be eligible for parole in the year 2011. The interracial killings, like the one you're about to see, often make headlines. But the fact is that 88% of white victims are slain by white killers, 
and 95% of black victims are slain by black killers. Most murder victims know their killers, but stranger to stranger homicide, random killing, is what shocks and terrifies us the most. Clyde Brown, 35, murderer. Serving two consecutive sentences of life without parole, plus 44 years. Brown's known victims have included white and Asian women. When Brown was 16, he dropped out of school and pursued a life of crime. He's never held a regular job. He was the father of seven children, but to him, life is cheap. Toby Israel, victim, fatally stabbed eight times by Brown in 1980. He was 19 years old, a promising photographer. Toby. My little Toby. A lot of joy and love and happiness. She was a, the most adorable little girl. Big brown eyes and black curly hair and everybody loved her. I loved to pinch her little tush and her little thighs and her cheeks and anything I could get. She was kind of tomboyish, I would suppose, when she was younger. She could uh, outrun her brothers and outplay them. She was about 16. She was still fun and games. <laughs> rebellious, though. A little rebellious. She wanted this old blue, silver blue Chevy pickup truck. She got a driver's license. And that's her blue Chevy pickup truck. And she was really happy. She thought she was pretty hot stuff. <laughs> I loved her. To kill someone is like taking taking a a balloon, taking a balloon and, and taking it in your hands, a balloon blown up and, and squeezing it and listening to it pop. At the end, there's nothing left. And all the air is gone. The Toby Israel case was a burglary at first, but some type of way it turned into a murder. Most of us feel that those kind of things don't happen to a family like ours. And uh, we look for answers. And there aren't a lot of answers. I killed Toby Israel because I didn't want to leave the witness behind. I didn't want her to identify me as being the, the, the portrayer of her house. Toby is not, was not the only victim. We all were victims. I mean, it's like a mass murder. Everybody, every aunt, every uncle, every friend, every brother, every sister. Everybody suffered. Everybody. It's just like we always stabbed in the heart. 
I found I found crime very exciting. I uh, it was like when I would run, the adrenaline would shoot through my body and it would feel good. Yeah, it was like it was like playing sports, especially when you make the the winning basket or the winning run. I I think I'll always cry. I'm crying until I until I die. I'm sure I'll still cry. Brown murdered another young woman a few weeks after Toby Israel, and has committed other violent crimes. He is serving his time in maximum security. He has five brothers, four of whom are also in jail. What went wrong? Well, actually, I was 16 years old when I got married. I had Clyde before I married. And I'm now the mother of 11 living children. My father and my mother, they were never married. So I was born out of wedlock. And uh, my mother, she married uh, Willie Warren, my stepfather. And after a while, he got, he was... He was playing around on her, going out, seeing other women. So one day, he woke up and he was gone. So she left us in an apartment with no money, no food. So the only source of food was the boys had to go out and they would take uh, a certain amount of food a day, one meal. Mornings, we'd get up, clean up the little ones. And I would leave. I would go out and I would make burglary, come back and feed my brother and sister. Yes, I knew they were stealing it, but it was the only source of survival. I, I found that it was easier for me to go out and take from people than to go out and work. And it got so easy to me that it was just, uh, it was like a, like a job. If you call, eating one meal a day, a loaf of bread and a package of lunch meat, this is what we had each day for lunch. Then I'm guilty. I I did have a lot of anger. And I wanted to get back at everybody and everything that was alive, that was prospering, that was uh, doing the right thing. I was so full of wrong till that was all. I just hated everything. I had no no caring for anyone. I just I just hated hated. I saw a man killed. And I said, wow, it looks easy. I said to myself, if I ever be in a position as to where I have to kill someone, it would be easy for me. It, it was like, well, I'll get back like this. Because it was so hard for me and my family at one time, one point in life, until... I didn't, I just, I just stopped caring. I stopped looking at life as it is. Need may have led Brown to burglary, but bitterness and contempt for life led him to murder and into prison for the rest of his life. But his mother's attitude toward his murders didn't seem to reflect the horror of his crime. I don't feel good about his behavior, you know, the crimes he committed. I didn't uphold Clyde when he done wrong, but I did stand by him, you know, when he was in trouble. Surprised by her composure in the face of murder, we asked her if she knew about the horrible crimes to which her son confessed. I'm aware of burglary. This is what I know about him taking that. 
not enough that I know about. Amazingly, Brown had never told his mother the awful truth about his murders. She was unable to attend the court proceedings, so until our interview, she was apparently unaware that he had stabbed two women to death. I never knew about that. Clyde is accused of two murders. I didn't know about that. I really feel connected to that woman, too. How horrible it would be to have uh, <clears throat> a child that did that kind of a crime. I think I would rather be hungry. I would rather be hungry. Brown's mother was devastated to learn the truth about her son. But how does he feel about the anguish he has caused? To find out, we showed him excerpts of our interview with Toby Israel's mother. I just, I don't understand how he could do that. I don't understand how he could take anybody's life. Um, we all make choices in our lives. You don't have to choose the life of crime because you're from poverty. That is not a real good excuse. I mean, there are a lot of people who come from poverty, come from, have hard lives, and do not choose that kind of life. Uh, all I can say is I can see the hurt in her. I could, uh, I don't know, I feel sorry for him. I mean, I'm angry at him for doing it. I mean, it was, that crime was hideous. But I don't know that he even realizes why he did that. I mean, I just don't know what kind of a man he is. Somewhere, life means nothing. Somewhere in his life, he made that, you know, there, there's no respect for life or for people. I'm sorry about it, but I know me being sorry will never make her feel any better or bring either one of them back. Brown expresses sorrow and remorse, but his words ring hollow because they don't appear to be accompanied by genuine emotion or compassion. In this, he is typical of other sociopaths, many of whom are free, and might suddenly bind any one of us in a web of horror and grief. Well, I think I am connected to him. I'm, I mean, I am connected to this man, whether I want to be or not, because I gave her life and he took it away. And uh, whether we know each other or not, or have met each other or not, we, she connects us to each other. She made us be Almost alike. She being the mother, I'm being the one that took the daughter away. So, the giver and the taker. Clyde Brown will die in prison. Whatever their backgrounds might have been, criminals must be held accountable for their crimes. They must be put away where they can no longer harm us. And anyone even thinking about committing a crime to take a lesson from the violent criminals we've met tonight. The lesson is that crime is also self-destructive. I was wrong. And uh, after I did it, I was hurting myself. 
I'm not proud of what I'm in here for. You see, I'm not proud of myself at all. I, I would say that I'm paying a very heavy price for, for my crime. Um, not only have I lost uh, the rest of uh, my life, I've lost my children's life. My, my, uh, I've lost my wife. Uh, and uh, I, I think quite a bit about what I, what I did and what happened. I cry when uh, my mother tells me that she misses me. I cry when it's hard for me to bring the truth out. I cry when when I see my children look at me and ask me, Daddy, when are you coming home? The six men we profiled began life as innocent children and wound up as violent criminals. What went wrong? For one, a street gang was his passport to a life of crime. A learning disability and possible brain damage seemed to play an important role for another. Two were born to mothers who were only 15 or 16. Three experienced violence in the home. Four grew up in low-income families. Four had parents or step-parents who themselves had criminal records. Four grew up without their natural fathers. Five had parents who abused drugs or alcohol. Five grew up with poor male role models. Five were unemployed when they committed the crimes we profiled. All six were high school dropouts. All six abused drugs or alcohol, or both. All six received little, if any, supervision in the home as children. Without question, what these criminals and most criminals have in common is an unstable, problem-plagued childhood. Well, I think it has to be understood that the family remains, in our society as in most societies, the main agency through which young people are socialized into becoming compassionate, cooperative human beings. Show me someone who is a, a genuinely violent, aggressive, predatory criminal, and I think I can show you someone who has had a very bad time during childhood in the family. Of course, some problems in our society are beyond the control of the family. Destructive forces like gangs, drugs, alcohol, unemployment, mental illness, and poverty. These are society's problems, too. Problems that require a major commitment of our communities and our government officials. By cutting the most basic services that can help families in need, as we've been doing in recent years, we contribute to the cycle of violence that is passed on from generation to generation. But many children grow up surrounded by destructive social conditions, and they don't become violent criminals. What makes the difference? Our research suggests that the primary answer is responsible parenting. That means responsible mothers and fathers who spend as much time at home with their kids as they possibly can. Parents who listen to their kids. Parents who teach the difference between right and wrong by their own behavior. Parents who provide supervision and discipline that is consistent and not abusive. Parents who make their kids feel worthwhile and loved. Based on our research, here are some practical, common-sense suggestions to help you keep your children from becoming involved in crime. I didn't have the parental guidance, I guess, until, was, until after I was 14, 15 years old, and then it was kind of too late. I had my own, my own head on my shoulders. Kids left alone often get into trouble. If you can't be at home, move heaven and earth to arrange for daycare a relative, or a responsible substitute to be there with your child. I went out in the street and I learned just about every bad deed that there is to learn. Know where your kids are. Keep your children away from troublemakers. The only way to do that is by being involved. Make yourself aware of their daily activities. I ran my own program. Did what I wanted because there was no good. Set reasonable rules of behavior concerning getting up and going to bed, curfew, homework, and chores. 
kids need limits and structure. Both my parents were easy to get around, soft touches, so to speak. They, uh, uh, if we were grounded for two weeks, it was lucky if we made it through the one week. Check on your kids to make sure they follow through on your rules. Provide agreed upon rewards and penalties. Never switch rules mid-game. My mom loves it. But as far as giving that hug or whatever, I mean, I don't remember. Kids need to be held, hugged, and kissed as much as they need food and water. Affection is crucial. My dad, you know, stopped drinking. And I got real close to him. And that's when I was able to, you know, come out a little bit, you know, like, hey, this is how I feel. Listen to me and he'd sit there and listen to me. Listen to your kids. Encourage them to get their feelings out by talking to you. Pent up frustration or anger can lead to violent outbursts toward others. I used to go to one class in the morning to report in and be gone all the time. I was gone so many times that they quit calling home. If necessary, check with teachers every week to make sure your kids are attending classes and completing their homework. I was the only one in classes who couldn't learn, and uh, so it did make me feel an outsider. Have your child tested for possible learning disabilities such as dyslexia. Treatment is available. Hyperactivity is another problem for which treatment is available. My brothers and my sisters were gang members. I just grew up in that. That was what to do, you know what I mean? And from, I guess, the support I didn't get at home, I got through the streets, through my friends, from my own place. Look for patterns or signs of gang involvement. Graffiti, gang-related symbols or clothing, tattoos. Even if your kids are just copying these things, they could be vulnerable to gang-related violence. Well, my mother, she always was concerned about where the things came from. But I would lie to her. I would tell her that I would, had been working on the car or I had just went over to the supermarket and swept up and they gave it to me. If your child repeatedly has unexplained money or possessions, they might be stolen. Confiscate these items until you know where they came from. Yeah, you know, I was like the this, this school bully, you know, and me and my buddies and, you know, have this little group of friends, you know, and if they had a problem, they come to us and we'd go take care of it for them. Constant fighting is a sign of trouble that can't be ignored. Another clear warning is the abuse or torture of animals. If your child is violent, don't try to handle it alone. Get help. I was using uh, marijuana and alcohol uh, quite a bit until by the time I was uh, in my late uh, teens, which uh, was probably uh, at least a, uh, an every other day thing, if not a daily occurrence. Look for signs of substance abuse, emotional withdrawal from the family, lying, sudden mood swings, slipping grades, changes in sleeping patterns, depression, talk of suicide. Then my mother found out that I was smoking it and she um, told me that uh, she'd rather me do it at home than do it in the streets. So, you know, I smoked me a joint, you know, right there. She said, you ain't got to smoke it with your... With your friends, you can smoke a joint with me. Exposing kids to drug and alcohol abuse is dangerously irresponsible. If you or your mate or your kids are abusing alcohol or drugs, go for help. It's definitely a tough job raising a child. All parents have problems, and we all make mistakes. But the big mistake, not reaching out for help when you need it. Remember... Nothing is more important than your family, and no job you'll ever have is more important than the way you raise your kids.